How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. Did you know Perkin Elmer Genomics was one of the first laboratories to offer whole genome sequencing on a clinical basis? Whole genome sequencing can maximize clinical diagnostic yield for patients. With turnaround time of four weeks for the proband sample, Perkin Elmer's whole genome sequencing test is designed to provide access to additional valuable information compared to an exome. Perkin Elmer also offers prenatal whole genome sequencing as well as ultra rapid whole genome sequencing for critically ill newborns using dried blood spots. The ultra-rapid genome has a turnaround time of five days and includes mito, chromosomal CNV analysis, STR, TNR screening, and biochemical analysis. Also, listen back to episode 176 with Dr. Maduri Hegda, where we explore the power of whole genome sequencing, which also happens to be one of my favorite episodes of DNA Today. And stay tuned for a couple more episodes with Perkin Elmer soon. Discover all that Perkin Elmer Genomics has to offer at perkinelmergenomics.com. My guest today is Dr. Sam Sternberg, who is a protein RNA biochemist and CRISPR expert. He runs a research laboratory at Columbia University, where he's an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics. Dr. Sternberg and Nobel Prize winner Dr. Jennifer Doudna wrote the book, A Crack in Creation, which chronicles the development of CRISPR and explores bioethical aspects of the technology, which is kind of my favorite part of the book that we're going to get into. Their book was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the New York Review of Books called it Required Reading for Every Concerned Citizen. Dr. Sternberg, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Kira. Great to be here. So I wanted to start out, I think most people listening probably know what CRISPR is, but I'm sure over the years you've gotten good at what your elevator pitch answer to what is CRISPR. Yeah, so I think about CRISPR in two buckets. The bucket most people will know about is gene editing. So this new power to rewrite DNA with exquisite accuracy inside living cells. You can think about curing genetic disease, engineering plants and animals for agricultural purposes, doing research in the lab. I mean, this is a power that spreads into every sector of biotechnology you can imagine. Where my passion started with CRISPR is how it exists in nature, which is actually in bacteria to protect bacteria against viruses. So for me, CRISPR is really this amazing discovery that led to technology development, but it started by focusing on a really basic question how do cells ward off infections? So just like we have to deal with coronavirus infections and other viruses, monkeypox, bacteria also have viruses that infect them all the time, and CRISPR is one of their most powerful ways to defend themselves. So it's like their immune system. It is. And actually It's really cool. It's really cool. And you know, fifteen years ago we thought bacteria were very simple. They only had one or two kinds of immune systems. That has exploded in the recent years. There's now a new conference called Beyond CRISPR because CRISPR was just the beginning of this new explosion in dozens of new kinds of defense systems. So I'm kind of geeking out on the biology side of CRISPR, but there's so much That's new. That's what the show so, is for. Yes, please do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, CRISPR is an amazing immune system. So I often think that, you know, we're the higher organisms, but actually bacteria have innovated all of the tools that our bodies use to ward off infections. And now the ways that we're trying to cure disease, cure cancer in humans is also making use of these amazing inventions that nature and bacteria have already come up with. So kind of one of the themes of my lab is go back to the biology to discover what a billion years of evolution have already done. And then those are the things that we're picking and choosing from to make new tools. 
which makes sense because it's not perfected, but it's it's been, you know, evolution things have been really worked on for so long. It's like, let's learn from that and see what we can build from it. And I think this is such a great example of how basic research can lead to such a game changing. Now we've kind of turned this into a technology from what we've discovered that's naturally occurring. Um, Cause I think a lot of people are like, oh, basic research, like they hear about people studying this and that. And it's like, well, we can really glean a lot of information from that and turn it into something that can save lives. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Can you share with us your experience of working closely with Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Doudna? I mean, what were the major CRISPR developments that you guys worked on together out in California? Yeah, gosh, I have such an amazing set of memories from my time there. Um, and I recently, so I guess they're inviting the past two years of Nobel laureates back to Stockholm this coming December. And I made it onto the invite list. So I'm like nice. super excited to get to go and just see the 2022 laureates and the past two years of laureates get awarded their prize by the king and all that stuff. Yeah, Jennifer, you know, I have to say, um, also having started my own lab four years ago, I have a totally newfound appreciation for how incredible of a mentor she was because now I'm living through all the new challenges and pressures and stresses of thinking about the science you're doing, thinking about how to manage and mentor a lab full of people how to interface with editors and investors and you know other academic colleagues. And I think Jennifer just excels in every one of those areas. Um, so gosh, yeah, it was, I mean, I think early on the lab was about 30 people. And so as a first and second year grad student, it's a little bit intimidating. You don't get a lot of face time with her. You have your one meeting every two or three months and you know, it feels like a lot of pressure to show her something when you're just getting started in the lab. But then over time, I think as my research really picked up, I started to see all these amazing opportunities to, to kind of hear about how she tells a story, how does she think about putting data together into kind of a really compelling manuscript. And then watching her present, I think Jennifer is one of the best science communicators that I've had a chance to work with. She just has yes, this Yes, I've seen her present and she's just so good. And it's like, you know, it's giving a talk at a conference, it's talking to the media in the, you know, dozens or hundreds of interviews she gives. It's giving TED Talks. I mean, she just knows how to pitch her science in a way that's accessible. And I think, I think about that a lot. I think about that a lot with my students. How do you talk about your science in a way that will get people excited and not throw a bunch of jargony acronyms at them that you know, give the glaze over look right away? Um, so I just learned so much from her. And I think I've appreciated after the fact things that I didn't even you know, recognize at the time that now I'm building off of instincts that were developed during my, my five years in her lab. Yeah, it sounds like it's just amazing people that have been able to work with her. And yeah, I've, I certainly admire her for so many things that, you know, you've listed and, and being a woman in science and, um, you know, very cool that the Nobel Prize winner is two women for CRISPR. Amazing. I think that also is just really, really cool. When I saw that, I was just like, wow. And I woke up to the news that morning, whenever it was. Um, so yeah, definitely admire her science communication skills and everything. So when you were working in the lab with her and with other team members, what were you focused on with CRISPR? Yeah, so I, um, I always like to remember when I started in the lab, but there were two people working on CRISPR. And when I joined and decided to not work on the other part of the lab, which was focusing on something called RNA interference, major area of research, um, had also been awarded the Nobel Prize in the mid 2000s, the, you know, foundational technology to think about new ways of treating diseases. Going and working on CRISPR seemed like a big risk because it was this new niche area of biology and microbiology. What is this useful for? And I think at that time, there were hints of like the future potential, but it felt risky. And so early on, we had very fundamental questions in bacteria. How do these things work? Why do these immune systems defend cells against viruses? Are they using protein molecules? Are they using RNA molecules? Which molecules interact? How are those interactions used to recognize DNA from viruses? So we had very basic questions that I think you know, required years of research before we actually had the knowledge about CRISPR-Cas9, which is this one amazing enzyme that can use an RNA to cut DNA with this amazing precision. And so once we had learned about that, I published a couple papers on on kind of a little bit more niche areas. And then once the Cas9 work started by a postdoc in the lab, 
then my attention really turned to how does this enzyme work and how does understanding its basic mechanics allow us to build more accurate versions. So my questions were um, kind of studying the enzyme properties using biochemical experiments and then we used that to engineer variants that had point mutations that were more accurate in terms of discriminating off targets which is now a big point of attention in the field is like yes we can do very high efficiency editing at site a that we care about but what about sites b c d e f and g that cas9 or crispr can also erroneously edit um, how do we avoid those off target effects so a lot of my work was focused on understanding how the enzyme controls those, and then how can we use that knowledge to build better versions. And you brought up off-target effects a couple times in a crack of creation, a crack in creation. I mean, you brought up an interesting point with it. Would these off-target effects possibly be equivalent or less than mutations we acquire just from living, right? Like, I've been at the pool a lot this summer. I'm always putting the sunblock on, but you know, those UV rays are causing mutations on my skin. So any just in, in normal environmental exposures, like, is that, a, could it be equivalent where it's like, yeah, we're so focused on it, but I don't know. I mean, obviously when we started off target effects were, were more common than I would think now. Cause you're talking about maybe 10 years ago. Am I getting that yep. right? When you were out in California? Okay. Um, so yeah. What do you think about that? No, you make a fantastic point Kira. And, um, I mean, you made the point in the book, well, I'm just bringing it up. <laughs> but, yes. but you crystallized in a way that is probably better than we did in the book, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I think it comes down to you're going to go to the beach or go to the pool regardless of whether or not you get a gene editing intervention. So it's about the kind of risks and benefits of the intervention, which is going to add additional risks than the risks that are already inherent to like you living your life. So with a patient with a devastating disease, the, the risks of some rare off targets against the spectrum and backdrop of mutations that they'll probably acquire through normal cell division and exposure to like UV rays is not going to be, you know, overweighing the benefits of this potential treatment. Whereas let's say a more like uh, enhancement type intervention that's not necessary for preventing or treating disease, then you'd say, well, gosh, these risks really don't seem that tolerable given that you know, they're not overweight or they're not outweighed by the benefits. So for me, it's kind of going to come down to that. I do think there's a, there's a bit of a hypertension on off targets for exactly, you know, should be mitigated by the points you make, which is if this is really needed for the patient and the level of off targets isn't going to be competing with what they're going to get in the random exposure of the day, then maybe we don't, like it's acceptable to have some low level risk as long as we understand the frequency and the sites. And I think you make a good point that 10 years since this was first developed, the tools to study off targets and the variants that reduce them have exploded. So we now can test the gene editing drug in the laboratory or even on patient cells before putting the cells back into the patient and catalog every single off target, look at where they are in the genome, see if they even matter. Are they in a gene? Are they in a gene desert? That's probably not going to impact the the physiology of the cell and then decide what's the risk level of those off targets. It's really cool that you're able to do really almost like post testing after using CRISPR to, as you said, say, okay, these are the pathogenic variants that have happened, the mutations. Are, are these going to have any detrimental effects? Because we know there's some changes of a single letter in DNA that changes that causes a whole disorder, right? We see that with cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, so many different single gene disorders. So if you can look and be like, oh, this really makes no effect on someone's health, like this is just, this is fine, um, then you could go ahead and put it back in. So I think that's yeah. that's interesting, especially because the book's been out, what did it come out? 2017, 2018? 2017, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is already, it's already old news, right? I mean, it's- I know, in God, genetics, it's many, like a little old, right? <laughs> But it's, I think, like, my favorite part of the book that I mentioned is just, like, the bioethics part and just thinking about, like, how we can improve this. And I think with this part of, like, the off-target effects, I mean, do you think we can adjust dosage of, like, how much CRISPR you're giving and also location? So use an example. Sickle cell has been one that is now people are being very early stages, like I was reading um, Code Breaker by Walter Isaacson. Um, and so, you know, he was, that just came out um, in the last year or so. 
And he's talking about people that have sickle cell that are starting to be treated like very early. Um, so it's not it's not clinically being offered. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, so with that, like they're taking out what bone marrow cells, fixing them with CRISPR so that they don't have the sickle cell mutation and then putting them back in. So it's not like we're able to target that. Do you see that as a possibility in terms of like, let's say cystic fibrosis, where mostly the lungs and the GI tract is affected, but really the lungs, where if we're giving someone CRISPR, like giving, we can't take the lungs out and do that, yeah. put them back in. So if, can we just target only the lungs will have them and not have their whole body have the CRISPR? Yeah, you brought up so many interesting and important themes there. Um, and I was just at a cystic fibrosis meeting a month ago in Seattle, which was incredible. It was founded by the, the, fun, the foundation that funds a lot of CF research. And just to mimic or steal some of the words from three of the talks, delivery, delivery, delivery. That's one of the big challenges for many diseases where you can't take the cells out of the patient and edit them in the lab which, I mean, it's not a coincidence that many of the major CRISPR therapeutics companies have started with so-called ex vivo therapies. First of all, blood disorders, like we know the cell population that needs to get edited, and those cells are accessible. If you mobilize the hematopoietic stem cells, you can take them out. I mean, this is basically doing what is already a cure for sickle cell, which is a bone marrow transplant, but instead of having to find that rare matched donor, let's use the patient themselves as their own donor and just edit and correct their cells. In one that brief, one letter, right? In that <laughs> like one for, letter. For sickle cells, it's one letter, yeah. Although, well, slight technical detail, the current clinical trials, which are in the clinic, but they're not like commercialized and FDA approved yet, um, the drug at least, they're not actually correcting the sickle cell mutation. Oh, are they doing um, the fetal hemoglobin? Exactly, yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Now, we that talked said, about that like a hundred episodes ago or something. I remember, yeah. <laughs> there are there are other clinical trials that are um, either begun or recruiting patients. One of them is coming from a company called Graphite Bio. That is actually a corrective cure using CRISPR Cas9, but a different kind of edit to rewrite and correct the actual sickle cell mutation. So that is another strategy, and I think sickle cell is going to be one of these early disease indications. We're probably four different approaches with gene editing are on the clinic simultaneously, which is a wonderful thing for the field. It's not from a competitive angle. It's like, we need to find the best cure and let's not be overly selective early on about putting all of our eggs in this basket. We should see among the many different approaches of this problem, which is the best. But yeah, coming back to CF and many other disorders, how do you get CRISPR into the cell, into the right organs? That's and there was an amazing talk on even just the layer of mucus and that the biofilms in the lungs that even prevent a viral vector or a lipid nanoparticle, these kind of viral delivery vehicles that get CRISPR in the cell, they have to penetrate an amazingly dense mesh of stuff just to get into the human cells in the lung. Um, so how do you do that? And then there, you can't go and pull back CRISPR if it starts making off targets. You can't detect the off targets and say, oh, this was a bad batch of cells, they're already in the patient, right? So there I think that probably that risk benefit assessment is gonna have a higher bar to, to kind of cross over. You're gonna need a lot more animal model testing because you can't, you can't do the ex vivo test there. You need to do it in the patient and test it in other animal miles to really make sure that it's safe enough for use. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And it makes sense that we're really starting with sickle cell because of the way we're able to take the bone marrow cells out, fix, put it back in. Whereas, you know, conditions like cystic fibrosis, where it's like we can't just take someone's lungs out, fix them and put them back in. Um, that's, that's a little bit more layered. Very soon, we'll be celebrating a decade of DNA Today. That's right, we released our first episode on September 1st, 2012. It also coincides with our 200th episode. We wanna mark these milestones with you on the show. So send in your favorite episode. You can write it, or better yet, record a voice memo sharing your favorite episode and why you enjoy listening to the show. After all, our podcast would not be possible without you loyal listeners. That's why we want to celebrate together. Send in your voice memo or written message about your favorite episode of DNA Today to info at dnapodcast.com. The deadline is August 27th. Again, send in to info at dnapodcast.com and your voice might be featured. 
Thank you to all the listeners for nominating us in the podcast awards. You did it. We have officially been nominated. It is year number six of being nominated. And hopefully it's going to be our third time winning the Best Science and Medicine Podcast Award. But that's only going to happen if you check your inbox for an email from the podcast awards with the subject line, podcast awards, final slate voting. If you got this email, you are one of the lucky few that were selected to be a voter. So it is imperative that you vote and support the show. I was actually one of the people selected and I got the email on Monday, August 8th. So maybe you got yours then as well. There's a hyperlink to get you to the voting page. You do have to quickly log back in with details you used when you nominated us. Once you do, select DNA Today in the Science and Medicine category. Don't forget to select your other favorite podcasts. Then hit the Save Nominations button at the bottom. It's that easy. You have until September 10th to do this, but please do it now if you got the email so you don't forget. Perkinell Elmer Genomics is a global leader in genetic testing, focusing on rare diseases, inherited disorders, newborn screening, and hereditary cancer. Testing services support the full continuum of care from preconception and prenatal to neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Testing options include sequencing for targeted genes, multiple genes, the whole exome or genome, and copy number variations. Using a simple saliva or blood sample, Perkin Elmer Genomics answers complex genetic questions that can proactively inform patient care and end the diagnostic odyssey for families. Learn more at PerkinElmerGenomics.com. And I, I think kind of taking a, a step back in terms of looking at this from an ethical standpoint, I mean, you you brought up a really good question in the book, you, you and Dr. Doudna, like, would CRISPR inadvertently widen our social or genetic inequalities, or would it usher in a new eugenics movement? I mean, this is something that is going to constantly come up for us in genetics because we do have that history. Um, it's something that, you know, I think we all need to be mindful of and talk about. I mean, there's also the concept of like things are really expensive at first and only the rich can afford it, but then everybody's able to get access to it because of supply, demand, how technology gets better over time. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I, maybe we should make one distinction here, which is I, I think some of those um, discussions around the genetic haves and have nots was thinking more long term if we were using this to make lasting heritable changes which is one of the major controversies, which you know, we wrote about as a hypothetical in 2016 or when, whenever we wrote the manuscript, and then a year and a half after the book came out, gosh, front page headlines around the world, this was done in China. Two living babies have mutations in their entire body that were introduced by CRISPR. So all of a sudden we're in this post-CRISPR edited embryo era where it's been used clinically so, yeah, it was very interesting to read that and see you guys like hinting at like being very scared of this future. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it happened like <laughs> a year after the book was published, like just wild. Yeah, and we didn't, I don't know if we put predictions about how quickly it would happen. I don't think I was that surprised that it was within five years, but what was especially dramatic is that the announcement came on the eve of the second international summit in human gene editing, this big international conference to address the question, how should we use gene editing in humans? So everyone's flying to, I think it was in um, Southern Hong Kong, I think it was in Hong Kong in 2018. So everyone Sounds around right, the world yeah. is flying there to engage in this question and then the night before the conference starts, this announcement, announcement comes out that actually there'll be a presentation of it being already done in the clinic. Right. So really, really, Kind of earth and that, and that scientist had had that talk planned, but didn't really say until the night before what was going to be included in it. So a lot of drama there. Yeah. And by the way, he did end up going to jail for three years. Um, according to the news, he, he was released recently because that's now three years right, ago. Right. I was going to say, yeah, it, it must have been recently. But yeah, and his institution, you know, I think he was either fired or th there was there was consequences, but not as much as I would have thought. Yeah. And, and you know, um, in assisted reproductive technologies like in vitro fertilization, like genetic testing, these are probably things as a genetic counselor that you know a lot more than me about. Those are already practices that are pretty widespread, at least in the U.S. and 
accessible but at a price and often not covered by like standard insurance so yeah if you have twenty thousand dollars to burn you can go and maybe use IVF not even because of fertility needs but because maybe in 2022 you think it's actually safer to select an embryo among 10 or 20 that were fertilized based on the sequencing done at day five to make sure that there's no spectrum of carrier mutations or disease associated variants that our latest databases say could be linked to higher levels of heart disease. Um, what is that going to look like in five or 10 years from now or 50 years from now? So if CRISPR has already been used in that context in 2018, yes, there's definitely a lot of taboo and like backlash around that, but that's going to change over time. And so I do think we need to be thinking now about how these technologies will continue to change in the future and make sure that we're proactively and prospectively making sure we're thinking about the long-term consequences. And that's where I see this issue of um, unequal access being particularly problematic. In the case of like treating diseases like sickle cell and, and cystic fibrosis, you know, I think once those drugs become commercialized, they're going to be covered under the right kinds of you know, insurance coverage where they should be accessible to patients that need them. But cost, there's going to be an issue too. I think some of the latest gene therapies that have finally made its way to market have a price tag without insurance of like a million dollars. So yeah, I think of something like I mean I don't think it's it's not gene editing, but spin Raz is something I think about for SMA that has been a game changer. Um, and we had uh, Dr. Stan Crook on on the oh, show, great. who's one of the um, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's just it's it's great that we have these advancements, but then can people even afford this, yeah. right? So it's, yeah, and, it's, and I, it's definitely interesting. And I don't have expertise on, on the financials or the economics of healthcare. I'd say from the science side, let's create opportunities by figuring out how to cure these diseases or treat these diseases in better ways than we can do today. And then there is a whole separate issue of how to bring those treatments to the public in a way that is widely accessible, affordable, is not going to be discriminatory in terms of who has access. Like that is a different problem to solve, but we can't even address that problem if we don't have the cures in the first place to work with. So I think we're right. Let's figure that out first and then get to yeah, the next yeah. part. Um, you know, speaking of this and just like ethical conundrums, do you think someday it will be unethical to not use CRISPR to prevent conditions, predispositions? I mean, you know, you were talking about with like IVF of you can choose an embryo that um, screened negative for a bunch of different conditions or isn't going to be a carrier so they won't experience those issues if they want bio kids someday. But is it going to flip where we say now, oh, is it ethical to use it? What about once it's developed and everything? Is it unethical not to use it? Yeah, I mean, I it, it feels scary to imagine living in that kind of a world. Um, that's where I come back to like some of the adverse pressures and forces in the early 20th century where, you know, we should think about who who should or shouldn't breed. That's like not the kind of involvement of government or medicine that I want getting into like a private decision between parents about when to have a kid and how to have a kid. And I'm a bit, I don't have kids yet, but I feel quite traditional and like, let's have a kid the old fashioned way and not try to use technology to pick the best one. It, it somehow doesn't feel like an intervention that I would want. But on the flip side, I mean, there are some populations where doing um, carrier mutation screening on the parent side has been really important to prevent diseases that are more concentrated in certain populations. And and I think we, we shouldn't overlook the chance for, for science to help to help us make sure that kids have a chance for a long life without disease. So yeah, what is the right use of science to kind of inform best decisions without creating pressures that, I don't know, force us to change our views on disability or, or what is even like a genetic disease versus just a different way of existence. Um, so I, I, I guess hopefully in the book we make the point that we don't really have answers on these things and I think no one scientist or regulator or policymaker has the right answers that should work for everyone. It's a matter of kind of collectively being aware of changes in technology and making sure that we don't let them run amok or let them push society in a certain direction without us thinking about it and making sure that it's the right way we want to go. 
Yeah, I think you guys did a great job in the book of like, you're just bringing up these questions so that people are thinking about them, but we don't have the answers. But that's kind of the point I felt like of the book is like, it made me think a lot more. And like, there's a lot of books where it's like, it's giving you the answer, but it's a little bit more thought provoking the way you guys approach the book of just like, let's bring up like, we're giving you the information so you can think about it more deeply. Is there anything since it's been published that, you know, if you guys were to have a second edition or add a chapter or something like, what would you want to add of, you know, obviously we've talked about some things throughout the interview here, but is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to see added in the future? Oh, I feel like there's five or 10 more books of material that would not all appeal to the same audiences. I mean, going back to me geeking out about science, the amount of new versions of CRISPR that have come out in the last 10 years is astonishing. The other... Like instead of Cas9, you're talking about the different exactly. Cas's and different... Like yeah. there's a whole book in and of itself right there. That might not be geared to the public. That'd be geared to more like... Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, that's, but that's super it. fascinating. Again, not just because of the gene editing side, but like why do all these different versions exist in bacteria? What is the evolutionary history and relationship between all of them that's actually related to a grant that I just wrote for the National Science Foundation, so I just spent a couple intense days thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, On the medical side, I mean, we now have functional cures for sickle cell. I think the recent data from this clinical trial that Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics have partnered on treated 70-something patients, and I think almost every single one of them has been transfusion-free for multiple years now. So, I mean, gosh, it, like, this was the dream 10 years ago with the advent of CRISPR-based gene editing that we could cure genetic diseases. And I think we're on the cusp of being there, being past that point. Yes, for one of the lowest hanging fruit diseases where we talked about you can take the cells out and do the ex vivo treatment. But I think a big feeling in the field is once we tackle sickle cell, then like the ability to go aggressively at the next kinds of diseases where now maybe delivery is going to be a bigger part of the challenge. We're going to have a lot more knowledge, a lot more kind of um, inertia and just push to go and get that done. Um, Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, the ethics like 2017 was already woefully out of date with what's happened since then. So you could write a whole whole other book on that. And then, of course, I I think Walter's book gets into more of the drama behind the scientist. And this was not one... Yes. He spent time with yeah. a lot of the scientists, I could tell, just from him writing. And, and it was it was a big book, I have to say. Like, I, I like diving into a big book, but it's also a little less intimidating to pick up a book that's around 200 oh, okay, pages. Good. I'm like, okay, this is a weekend read, you know? But I mean, so. what are, like, the, the, who are the personalities behind these discoveries and what were the, you know, alliances? What were the kind of um, comp- competitive races to get the science done? That's a really interesting part of science that when I started, I had this dreamy view that oh, everyone like does their little problem and then like comes to the conference, but there's actually exciting pressures to move quickly and how quickly someone else pushing on something. So the CRISPR saga with all the patents and the companies being formed has a lot of interesting personal drama that we didn't really get into in our book because the timing wasn't quite right. I think Walter covers a lot more of that, but I'm sure in the future there'll be more books from other individuals that might comment on some of those things. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And and hopefully we've convinced you all to read the book at this point. I've really enjoyed it. Um, it was a great summer read for me, um, a crack in creation. And we're actually doing a book giveaway. Um, so head over to DNA Today's social media. Just search DNA Today on all the platforms um, and enter to win your own copy. Um, yeah, definitely really recommend it. And Dr. Sternberg, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I was just very excited when I reached out and you're like, yeah, let's do it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. So um, I have to say you're very casual, laid back in a great way that I think people, like you were complimenting Dr. Duadna for, like you have the same skills no. in terms of just being such a good science communicator and, and saying things in the way that people can follow along and not getting wrapped up in all of the details and jargon as we talked about. So thank you for being like an awesome science oh, thank communicator. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> really enjoyed it. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. 
And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kira Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.